very grateful that she's agreed to give a talk today. So thanks so much, Alison, and I'll come back in with the questions later on. Cheers. Thanks, thanks a lot, Garen, and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, in this series. Uh, very well timed for my final week at NIAB, so also a, a great chance to say goodbye and thank you to the UK plant sciences community. Uh, so we're going to start in the field today and then go to Martin uh, and Arabidopsis, uh, and I'm going to share some journeys uh, in wheat genetics um, and tell you a little, about, a little bit about what we've done uh, during my time at NIAB and then looking forward to the future. So first, the, the literal journey. So I, I grew up in Australia where I completed my PhD at the University of Sydney, uh, which also involved uh, many journeys uh, in wheat genetics. So I was lucky enough to collaborate with the Simit Winter Wheat Programme uh, in Turkey and spend a lot of time crawling around the grasslands of northern Turkey and uh, looking for the progenitor species uh, of wheat. Uh, so very relevant to the work we do at NIAB. Uh, and to also collaborate with Kansas State and Cornell Universities and Crop and Food in New Zealand. Uh, so that was a, a really good start in terms of my wheat uh, journey. Uh, and so in 2007, I rode out of the, the farmlands of Australia uh, and into the lush wheat, produ wheat production of, of East Anglia uh, and have been really privileged to, to be here in Cambridge uh, and at NIAB for that time. And I think it's really interesting for me to reflect on the progress of wheat genetics over this kind of 12 to 14 year period. Uh, and when I arrived in 2007, uh, it was a very different uh, wheat community to the one we have today and, and very different in terms of the resources available uh, supporting uh, wheat research uh, and breeding in the public sector. So there were a handful of mapping populations which were available and had been developed predominantly through the at the John Inner Center uh, we were using SSR markers at that time uh, and relatively minor and disaggregated funding for applied or translational uh, research. And so obviously a lot's changed uh, in that time and NIAB have uh, been involved in many of the initiatives to really accelerate uh, the base of, of wheat genetics and breeding uh, and to create enabling resources which are really important, uh, both supporting research efforts but also that translation into breeding. So we have vast germplasm resources, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the context of our work at NIAB, uh, as well as a vast array of genotyping and genomic resources. Uh, and corresponding to that, or perhaps independent, uh, is a, a real consolidation uh, and increase in the, in the total spend on wheat research and the collaboration across the UK community. Uh, and this is really important in terms of uh, joining up all of the pieces and adding value to those resources which have been developed and made available by the community. Uh, so this quote really sums up the work that we do uh, at NIAB and, and what really motivates me uh, as a scientist. So I ask not for a larger garden but for finer seeds uh, and really the seed is this, is this package of innovation. So it's the way that we can assemble uh, all the science, research and development, genomics technology, we have to be able to package it into a seed and then make that seed available to farmers to be grown in the field. And really that's what our work at NIAB is about. How do we package innovations into a seed and make it available uh, for use? Uh, and a lot of this involves the production of genetic resources and we've really tried to do this at scale. So generating large genetic resources and I'll talk more about these and about the use of them to support a genetic trait dissection. At NIAB, we've really focused on field-led characterization, so understanding how material performs in the field, uh, understanding how genotypes interact with their environment. Uh, and also, this helps us to inform where we intervene in a system. So how does this material perform in the field, uh, and how is it part of an agricultural system, uh, and how can that be optimized uh, to maximize performance? So it's really a privilege to have been in Cambridge, which is one of the centers of, of both genetics uh, and wheat breeding. So Cambridge obviously has a long history of genetics. So in the 1900s, uh, William Bateson and Saunders were doing really foundation work uh, and used the terminology genetics to describe the study of heredity. Uh, and it always fascinated me that Saunders did this, did the work on stocks here in the botanic gardens in Cambridge. Uh, and this is a really, uh, exciting component of genetics is that plants allow you to really visualize this genetic process uh, and, uh, and enable the rediscovery of, of Mendel's laws of genetics. 
Uh, and at that time, there was interaction with Sir Roland Biffin, who was the founding director of the Plant Breeding Institute, which was also here in Cambridge. Uh, and Biffin really asked, uh, how can we apply these Mendelian principles to plant breeding uh, and make that process of, of, um, of segregation uh, and inheritance uh, applicable to plant breeding? And that was really the foundation of the Plant Breeding Institute, which is a really important uh, public sector source uh, of wheat improvement for the UK. Uh, and it's always interesting to kind of look at the history and evolution of these institutes. So this early interaction between Bates and Saunders and Biffin to, to really embrace genetic principles as part of plant breeding. Uh, and then to really see the evolution of the Plant Breeding Institute applying these genetic uh, principles to the development of improved cultivars for UK agriculture. So in 1954, uh, the Plant Breeding Institute was still based on the Downing site in Cambridge and had a modest number of employees. Uh, and only 30 years later, it had grown in this huge uh, kind of proliferation of people, which to me always reflects uh, money available uh, and resources. Uh, and this embracing of genetics and moving it through uh, into uh, improved cultivars uh, led to this point in the 1980s, shortly before the privatization of the Plant Breeding Institute, where 90% of UK wheat uh, was originated or was grown from seeds produced at the Plant Breeding Institute. So this is a really uh, important legacy of both genetics uh, and plant breeding in the public sector in the UK. And this shows the, the wheat family tree, so the wheat pedigree, uh, and all of the coloured dots indicate varieties that were developed or descend from Plant Breeding Institute varieties. So these are varieties developed in the public sector and made available. Uh, and you can see their prevalence even now in our modern varieties. Many of them derive from this early work at the Plant Breeding Institute. Uh, so I really like this kind of pull through from these early days of discussions of Mendelian principles between Bateson and Biffin, the incorporation of genetics into plant breeding, uh, the production of varieties which were really the foundation and support of the UK agricultural sector and the legacy of those which lives on in our cultivars and varieties that are grown on farms today. So the work at NIAB uh, attempts to emulate that in, in some respect. Uh, and to really look at how we can use breeding tools and resources uh, to improve the breeding process uh, and to mobilize traits and make them available into breeding programs and ultimately onto farmers' fields. So our work focuses on breeding tools and genetic improvement. Uh, and this includes everything from genetic resources, which I'll talk about in a minute, through to marker-assisted selection and the use of biotechnology tools. Uh, and this is really genetics and breeding. How do we mobilize genetics into the breeding of wheat, which is the UK's major crop? Our work on genetic resources has really focused on the progenitor species of wheat. So wheat is a hexaploid which combines in its genomes the genomes of, of three ancestral grasses. Uh, and these came together over successive hybridization events uh, in nature. Uh, and we're most interested in the second hybridization event uh, which brought in the D genome of wheat from the wild goat grass Agilops tarsii. And, and goat grass or Agilops tarsii has a wide ecogeographical range, uh, so it, it, it stretches all the way through Turkey across the Tibetan plateau. Uh, and when I had been working in, in Turkey in my PhD, I'd observed this goat grass growing uh, in native stands alongside uh, cultivated wheat, uh, as well as uh, in very remote locations. Uh, and one of the nice things about our genetic resources is we're able to uh, access stocks of this material uh, from gene banks, uh, which enables us to use them uh, in the search for potential functional variation, which could be of use. So we hypothesized that if we went uh, to a wide range of goat grasses, uh, we were able to genetically characterize a relatively large uh, set of about 400 of these goat grass accessions from across that geographical range uh, and we hypothesized that these would this was variation that wasn't present in the bread wheat gene pool that could potentially deliver value to the UK breeding sector uh, and we've done this via the creation of synthetic hexaploid wheats so here we take uh, we essentially recreate this domestication event but starting with uh, an elite durum wheat as the initial hybridization event uh, and then pollinating it with the pollen of this goat grass donor Agilops tarsii. 
uh, and we produce uh, an unstable triploid and double the chromosomes using colchicine uh, to, pr to produce this synthetic wheat. Uh, and this synthetic wheat is really important because it, it in itself is not of a huge inherent value, but it's a vehicle for transferring the genetic variation held in these wild progenitor goat grass accessions uh, into our cultivated wheat gene pool. So we can make a cross to Robigus is the variety that we uh, predominantly use, but we can make a cross uh, to an elite hexaploid wheat line, uh, which would be grown and recognizable to a farmer. Uh, and this is a way for us to access the genetic variation uh, conferred by that goat grass ancestor. And here you can just see a couple of examples of derivatives from this. So where we've really significantly managed to increase the yield components and the density of the ear, uh, and these are the sorts of traits that we're interested in uh, in mining that goat grass uh, diversity. Uh, and this is analogous to, to hitting the jackpot because this is very much an exploratory uh, process where we need to create a huge amount of germplasm to enable us to identify superior individuals that can be taken forward into breeding. Uh, and a lot of things happen along the way. This has taken uh, over 10 years for us to achieve in our program. Uh, we have many, many problems with using wild relatives, which I'm sure people will be familiar with. So hybrid necrosis, so the inability uh, to form this bridge between the ancestral species and our elite varieties, shattering of seeds, so these pre-domestication traits, and very significant disease burdens because there's no presence of, of all the advanced uh, rust resistances, which have come in, in modern varieties, uh, very tall, very short material, the material is fundamentally quite difficult to work with uh, and it's probably not the core business of a commercial plant breeder because this is work that takes 10 years to get to the point where you have something which is finally usable as a resource uh, and that's the point we are in now at, in our pre-breeding program so after 10 years uh, we managed to to now produce material which is yielding uh, similarly to elite varieties uh, and this was really our objective as pre-breeders uh, to mobilize genetic variation from the wild relatives of wheat and, and to put it into a form that was accessible to wheat breeders uh, and also performed at the same level as our elite varieties. So we're providing new genetic variation, but in a form uh, that should be relatively immediately usable. And this is really significant for us to, to be able to produce material that yields at the same level as commercial varieties, but as a pre-breeding activity. Uh, because it's important to, to recognize the starting points of this for us 10 years ago were these goat grass accessions uh, which don't look anything like wheat that you would see uh, growing in a field uh, in fact they mostly look very weedy you have to hand hand process all of the seed so very far away from a cultivated variety uh, and this is really required very very extensive development of material in the glass house and then a huge kind of effort at scale in the field to be able to produce lines as you see on the right so this is one of our advanced breeding lines that actually start to look like wheat and, and produce a, a yield of that's very similar to our elite varieties but captures in its uh, in its genome this diversity from our ancestral species uh, and essential to this process also has been developing uh, genotyping arrays and, and and genotyping tools that are allow us to capture characterize the underlying genetics. So we're, we're attempting to bring in diversity from ancestral species uh, and we want to understand what we've actually done. So in future we can do this in a more targeted way. And we also make the material fully available uh, to the community uh, and this is really important for us in terms of uh, it's a 10-year process to make the material uh, and we want to maximize the potential downstream value of that material either for use in breeding or also in the use uh, understanding the basis of some of these exciting advantageous traits. So in addition to our work on uh, describing and, and characterizing and creating genetic resources, we've also developed a number of tools for high precision trait dissection. So we're really interested in the genetic basis of quantitative traits. So these are traits that are, that are controlled by multiple uh, loci often which interact with each other as well as the environment. And we created two magic populations, a magic diverse and a magic elite population, which sampled two different things. 
So the Magic Diverse found population has 16 founders and aim to sample diversity across time. So this starts with parents uh, which were released in the 1935 up till about 2000, the mid 2010s. Uh, and here we're, we're recombining diversity across time uh, and the elite population uh, recombines diversity um, across across a, sing, a, a more modern time scale, but across the breadth of the pedigree. So one goes across and, and one goes down the pedigree. And you can hear much more about magic populations at the seminar by Michael Scott and Funny Lajobi on the 24th of November. So I recommend you uh, attend that. So what we do when we create magic populations is make several generations of intercrosses. So if with the eight founder population, we start with 28 two-way crosses, 210 four-way crosses, and 315 eight-way crosses to recombine the genetics of those eight founder varieties. We can then use that population as a forward genetic resource. So to map a quantitative trait loci to understand, to help us get closer to the genetic uh, underpinnings of the trait variation that we're interested in. And then we have several avenues to use to, to further explore that variation and to allow us to characterize it and mobilize it for breeding. So we can select uh, extreme phenotypes, uh, and I'll talk a bit about this in a minute. We can validate uh, using other populations that we've developed, uh, and we can also refine, and I'll talk about this uh, in a bit more detail. So firstly, the selection of extreme phenotypes. So we've been using this this uh, approach to try and identify uh, extreme phenotypes for root system architecture. So a very simple seedling root trait uh, on the, the width of the root system. And so to do this, obviously, we have a thousand rills in our population and we need to assess this, uh, the, the phenotypes of interest. So this involves screening about 12,000 plants. Uh, and what we want to, what we can do is, is map and refine the QTLs, uh, which I won't present here, but is another uh, stream we're, we're following, but we can also use it from these thousand rills to select the very extreme tails of that population. So here we want to select uh, the very, the, the maximal extremities of the phenotype uh, and use these uh, in further exploratory uh, work. Uh, and we've done this just, I show here, our work on root system architecture, uh, and we really wanted to be able to identify really rapidly the most extreme root phenotypes. So we have these narrow types uh, and these wide types. So these are just six individuals from that set of a thousand rills, so the most extreme uh, phenotypic lines. And, and we can validate this with some initial shovelomics data, which shows that this is a, a relatively robust method for selecting these very extreme phenotypes. Uh, and then we can use these uh, extremes to really start to drill down into some of the traits that we're interested in, which is the interaction of root system architecture uh, with fertilizer nitrogen. Uh, and this really allows us to kind of get a much better hold on the trait variation uh, and the interaction between the root system architecture uh, and the nitrogen. And then whilst we've also got the QTLs discovered and we're working to validate them, we can use this kind of two, uh, two pronged approach where we have the extremes as our first kind of indication of the phenotype uh, and then our QTL neuroisogenic lines uh, used to validate that and to start to really uh, help us to really understand uh, the, how those traits are behaving uh, and, and how, how we contextualize those in, within our, our nitrogen research. So we can also, as I mentioned, uh, use these populations to refine genetic intervals. Uh, and this is really important, obviously, in terms of the next step into the use of this information uh, in breeding programs. So when I first uh, came to NIAB, we were working on the photoperiod response gene, PPD1, uh, in a collaboration with Dave Laurie and Adrian Turner at the John Innes Centre. Uh, and we were trying to identify additional controllers of flowering time. So flowering time in wheat is a really important trait because it determines seasonal adaptation. So as in many species, these key adaptive traits are, are really important for, for adaptation and for optimizing a yield in a production environment. And our hy hypothesis at that time when the, the photoperiod one gene had just been characterized in wheat, uh, and we had we knew that there were numerous allelic variation variants of the PPD1 gene on the A, the B, and the D genome of wheat. And, and so we proposed that actually 
this allelic variation could be very useful as a breeding tool because the photo period, the severe mutation in, in the photoperiod response gene gives you a very early flowering phenotype, which is not really appropriate for UK conditions. So this is kind of a two week shift in the phenology of the crop. So we propose that these additional allelic variants may provide a more moderate phenotype, uh, which would be useful as, as a tool for wheat breeding, which wants to advance flowering time by, by a much smaller margin than the 14 days on offer. And to do this, we did a lot of work to create um, an allelic series of all of these mutations that we knew existed in the photoperiod one a gene. We, we did a lot of crossing to, to create uh, these neurosogenics. We assessed them in multiple field trials. We assessed their yield uh, in the UK and also in environments all around Europe to really try and say, see what the potential of this additional allelic variation could be for breeding. Uh, and disappointingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, we saw that the major effects of this PPD1 mutation, which is this major mutation uh, that confers a, a two week difference in flowering time, uh, was always uh, significant, but this additional allelic variant variation didn't expand uh, our, our adaptive response or plasticity. Uh, so from this, we, we, we understood that, that this gene uh, wasn't going to potentially uh, be the answer to having a more, uh, the ability to fine tune flowering time to a greater extent in plant breeding. Uh, and recently, this is some work that Hester Sheehan was doing with me at, at NIAB recently, we've been really trying to understand what our breeding target is in terms of adaptive response. So seasons are becoming more compact in UK farming and so if you look out your window today it's probably raining uh, which is probably bad news for a farmer because at the moment is the peak time for sowing the crop for next year uh, and delays at this time, time of year are becoming more and more common uh, and this really pushes that optimal kind of crop management system out and ha has big implications for uh, the production of that crop in the next season. Uh, and this is true at the other end of the season as well. So the harvest window is also becoming hotter and drier, uh, which again puts these constraints on actual agricultural uh, production. And so we've been really trying to define what range of flowering times would be optimal in the kind of current shifting uh, and future changing uh, production environments in the UK. And then saying, can we answer this? Can we kind of make this idiotype or answer these questions using genetics? Uh, and for the question of can we use genetics um, to, to potentially help with this optimization for current uh, and future climate uh, scenarios, we've been really looking to, to understand more about the genetic basis of quantitative variation in flowering time. Uh, and we've generated data over six field seasons, uh, which we felt was what we needed to really capture uh, the range of, of very season to season variation. Uh, and this has allowed us to detect uh, some major QCL, some minor QCL, uh, as well as some growth stage and season specific variation. Uh, so this is really important for us because it, it provides the information that we need uh, to go forward to say, is this genetically tractable? Uh, and can we actually offer breeders and growers more plasticity in the flowering time available uh, in future wheat varieties. Uh, and because we're using the magic population, we can make some resources relatively quickly. So we develop markers because we have high density genotyping, gene expression data, uh, interaction data, and neuroisogenic lines. So we can, um, because we're using an eight founder population, we know more about the haplotypes of these variations. Uh, and we can also look at their interactions with major genes. So on the right, you see these are some of the effects we're really interested in. So in the presence of PPD, uh, one of these uh, loci that we've uh, identified is actually modifying the effect of the photoperiod response um, gene. So this is what we want. We want something that either dampens that response or provides an independent uh, controller of flowering time. So this is a really important use of the magic population uh, in addition to the selection of phenotypic extremes. So just to, to finish uh, and to, to remind you, I guess, that our, real, our objective and, and our mission really is to mobilize genetics uh, and innovations into seeds. And we do this into seeds because seeds are what farmers use uh, and what supports our food production systems. So at NIAB, we've done a lot of work on genetic resource generation at scale uh, and high precision 
genetic trait dissection. Uh, and I haven't talked about field-led characterization, but this all feeds into uh, a further really understanding of how crops perform in their environment and how they can be further optimized. And it's also allowed us to do uh, work at the level of the system. So at the level of the system, we're trying to bring together the work on adaptation, how this impacts water use uh, and how it interacts with nitrogen. And having this foundation of genetic resources and genetic information really allows us to make this tractable uh, and to deliver impacts from this work into farming communities. Uh, and this has been uh, many of our projects, but specifically a project called Sintron uh, was really special because it really took us all the way from genes, so very specific uh, genes and transporters uh, and very specific mutants and transgenics into the development of pre-breeding material and, and, and field trial systems that allowed us to understand nitrogen response in the context of the field production uh, and then to really transfer this to farmers in terms of improved decision making. Uh, and I think this is a great example, it's summarized in Stephanie's uh, tips paper, uh, of really what, how we need to look at research uh, that's going to be applied in the field uh, and how it can incorporate really fundamental genetic understanding all the way through to field valuation and engagement with farmers. So if I look back at how far we've come, we've come to this point uh, in 2020, uh, and I guess the question is what's next? So this is my list of what's next. So there's lots of kind of obvious next steps, uh, which involves a really, I think, uncovering structural variation in wheat is gonna be really exciting. Looking at haplotypes rather than single markers. I think more funding for everyone would be, um, I put that in bold because that's potentially a suggestion and also increasing international partnerships to deliver impact. Uh, and I guess that leads me on to my new role. So I'll be finishing at NIAB at the end of this week uh, and joining CIMIT to lead the Global Wheat Program. Uh, and I'm really motivated to join CIMIT because it delivers impact. Uh, and this slide really sums up for me uh, my motivation for joining CIMIT. So if we need to put innovation into the seeds, uh, then we need a CIMIT variety to deliver those seeds to farmers. So CIMIT or CIMIT lines, CGIA parents and lines in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa occupy uh, 70 to 80% of the release of material into the hands of farmers. So this is really important in terms of delivering our innovations uh, to where they are most needed uh, in future. Uh, so just to kind of come back to the reflection on the journey, when I started, uh, pre-breeding at NIAB. We didn't have glass houses at NIAB, so we drove to John Inner Center uh, three days a week where we rented glass house space uh, and spent eight hour days with Richard Horsnell and Nick Gosman, who are shown here, uh, making all of the crosses, which were the foundation for our pre-breeding program. I think today we have a, an amazing glass house facility uh, here at NIAB, uh, and it's, it's a really great to see the development of that infrastructure supporting uh, our work on genetics uh, and breeding. Uh, we also had back in 2007 a very relatively small group and slightly younger looking uh, and then I think that's also grown over this time and it's been great to see the engagement of early career scientists in particular with this with this idea of we need to translate research uh, and deliver impacts. It's been also a great opportunity for me personally um, to engage with the industry in the UK who've been really receptive uh, and really interested in understanding more about the potential of genetics, whether it be conventional genetics and plant breeding, so as pioneered by Bateson and Biffen, or the use of biotechnology tools uh, as, a, as something of, of use to agriculture uh, with breeders and agronomists, with politicians, uh, with, and even with the royal family, uh, which is quite uh, an interesting uh, experience in itself. Uh, and I also wanted to finish, um, yeah, you have to finish with an 80s quote. Uh, I think it's been such a privilege to be part of the UK plant sciences community. I can't obviously thank everyone or fit everyone on a slide, uh, but these are some of the people that I've really enjoyed working with. It's been a great privilege uh, and I'm particularly uh, in the way that these people work. I think I've really admired and learnt, learnt a huge amount from uh, and I've also been really privileged to be part of uh, a number of committees, so BBSRC Committee B, uh, not always the most uh, thankful, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that there, but um, it's been really great to be a member of, 
uh, BBSRC Committee B, Monogram, UK Plant Sciences, the Wheat Initiative, a genetic society and the Society of Experimental Biology, uh, and also to be on the editorial boards of Heredity and JXB. Uh, and I think you've got to make the community that you want to be part of, and, and I hope this continues long into the future. So with that, I will finish and say farewell. Thank you very much. Please keep in touch. Uh, let's work together and do incredible things. Thank you very much, Karen. Thanks, thanks very much, Alison. Wipe a tear from my eye there on that last that last slide of yours. Um, so we have some have some questions that have, have come in for you. So one of the people I, I know noticed on that final slide, so Catherine Denby has asked a question. So um, she asked a question about the synthetic wheat population and it's selected lines that have good yield and good height. So what beneficial traits have you managed to bring in from the wild goat grass? Yeah, so we've been really focused on yield and, and yield components because that's the priority of, of the commercial breeding sector in the UK. Um, so that's been the kind of forward focus of, of the, the core pre-breeding work. We have also been doing lots of work, uh, again, with the breeders to identify disease resistances uh, and other possible um, kind of disease associated traits and Brand Wolf's work, the work in his lab has been using goat grasses to, to clone resistance genes and has, has been really um, productive in, in doing that. Uh, and we're also, you know, we're we creating the material is a huge uh, effort over a long period of time. And we're really at that stage now about how do we, how do we best mine this material for favorable variation? Uh, and I think that's where collaboration is really uh, important. We're, we're driving forward in terms of, of those kind of conventional traits, um, but the material is, is there to be mined uh, in terms of, of, of other potential traits of interest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's something that comes across. You can give a 25 minute talk, but the enormous number of man hours that have gone into producing all that uh, gympasm is, is quite something. It's difficult to, to, uh, for people to understand if you don't really know how it works. I include myself in that number for sure. So, okay, we have a question from uh, Maria Jose Pilar Martinez Martin. And the question is, um, do you think that CRISPR-Cas9 could be the key for better varieties in terms of yield and grower returns? Um, or do you think that QTL and marker selection is still gonna be the best tool to reach that goal? How do you compare those technologies? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's always a question of, of what's the objective and, and, and the tool, de deciding the tool or the group of tools to, to meet that. I think, yeah, we've been having this conversation uh, quite a lot over the last couple of weeks about what the potential of, of CRISPR is, because obviously it can be seen as slightly more palatable uh, when you look at, at, at new breeding technologies. I think um, my answer is always that, that that's a, a toolbox of, of, of things that we can use. Um, I think for our work, we really see that CRISPR is very useful for, for certain specific um, traits and, and for use as a research tool. Um, and I think it's going to, to complement uh, and unlikely to, to replace, um, you know, our conventional breeding tools of marker assisted selection, uh, predictive breeding, because ultimately yield is a, is a quantitative trait controlled by thousands of genetic loci which interact with the environment and with each other it's very unlikely we're going to be able to CRISPR them all. Um, so that kind of quantitative breeding framework, I think will remain and we can use CRISPR as a tool to um, make fine tuning adjustments as, as we go along. Absolutely, the common misconception that the that CRISPR is the, is the magic bullet to do everything. It's just part of the toolbox. So a uh, question from Catherine Howarth. And she asked a specific question about the um, have, whether you've looked at the effect of photo period on root angle, the relationship between those things. And the short answer is no. So we're just developing the the nearest genics, which complement our phenotypic extremes, and then we're really ready to go to start to understand um, understand what we're, what we've done. Uh, so we're also working with Joe McKenna and other people to, to really try and characterize those mutants. I guess a lot of other research, you kind of start with the mutants. Uh, our work, we really have to create the mutants over a period of kind of 10 years. And then, and then we're kind of at start number two uh, to characterize them. But, but all of those questions are, are questions that are really interesting. And also when we make the material available, we hope um, that people will be able to use it to, to answer the questions that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So a question from uh, Nirajana 
uh, Murakan. This asks, uh, how long did it take to develop the magic population? And is it better to use GWAS or such uh, multi-parent populations for dissection of traits? Yeah, I mean, that's you, you should definitely read uh, Scott, Scott, Mike Scott's uh, review of magic multi-parent populations in, in Heredity, uh, which is just out, uh, which covers some of these um, questions. I think the magic population is, is a great resource. Um, and you can screen the eight founders of the population to see if it's likely to vary for your trait of interest. I think that's it's kind of a, an easy way in. So you can screen eight lines relatively easily. You know, you need to analyze them, but that's a kind of the way into that population. Uh, I think GWAS is obviously also a very useful tool if you think uh, there's going to be significant variation across a panel of 300 individuals. So again, it, it comes back to, to how heritable you think your traits going to be is it going to vary across eight elite parents or 16 diverse parents screen the parents decide on the best population uh, to use okay another question about the founder um the magic population this is from uh, raha uh, ragaputh pathy so uh, it might be a bit difficult to ask so he asks uh, could you give a cost estimate for the generation of the eight uh, of the 16 founder magic population yeah, I guess that's that's a big question in FTE, in FTE terms. Um, I guess to give you an idea, in wheat the the cycle takes quite. You know, you can only do two crossing generations a year. You're doing quite a few rounds of intercrossing, and then quite a lot of rounds of single seed descent before you can even get the material um, into quantities that will go into the field. Um, so I mean I think I can talk in terms of, of, of a time span of 10 years until you, from the initial cross to having your kind of skim seeked population that you're able to then then use really in earnest for your forward genetics. Um, cost, yeah, <laughs> there's a large cost associated with it. Uh, but I think that's one of the great things with all of these um, you know, BBSRC really supported the generation of a lot of these pre-breeding resources uh, and we've made them all available to the community. So they're, they are quite big resources to use in screening, but they've been made. So that kind of step one is, is done. Um, and and that's, that to me is very significant that, that we have that pool of resources available and with, with associated genotypes and, and sometimes trait data. So if you want to simulate your trait, you can kind of use existing trait data to do that. Yeah, it's now for the community to use the things that you've created for their own experiments, I guess. So, okay, let me just finish with a final question. So, as you said, you're going on to, to SIMIT. Um, let me ask, uh, you know, what role does the UK community play in, the, in more global efforts to, uh, to improve wheat breeding and, and improve? Yeah, genetics? I think the UK has a real critical mass of, of wheat researchers. Uh, and that's really important in terms of linking to the Global Wheat Program at, at CIMIT and really making sure, you know, CIMIT has the great ability to accumulate all of those innovations and to, to package them and to mobilize them into to farmers fields. Um, so I think that's a great complement in terms of what's available in the UK wheat community. But then I think if we also look into the UK plant sciences community, there's, there's such an amazing depth of skills. Uh, which just doesn't exist in organizations like CIMIT because it's very focused on that on that delivery of varieties uh, and interventions into farmers fields and I think um, we all want to use a more scientific lens for making improvements you know whether it's in our kind of lab experiments or in you know or in the way we deliver improvements to, to farmers so I think that there's kind of a greater breadth that we can explore with the UK community in terms of getting science mobilized into the hands of people and learning about the processes that we can use to accelerate that. So I think in terms of the wheat community, there's a, there's a great strength, um, which is kind of immediately usable. Um, and then I think coming back to the to wider U UK community, there, there's huge um, breadth that's available. And I think I'm particularly excited to see how we can make that happen. And we can really uh, use that both in terms of delivery, but also Kind of mutual understanding of how research for development works, how it's different to kind of pure research and where the two can meet and deliver mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll leave it there. That's a, a great 
a great uh, point to leave it on, I think. So thanks very much, Alison, for, for your talk today. That's been really great.